Hi, my name is Andrew Just, and I'm going to talk about the probability of weather type or pout methodology's top-down approach. The review here of the idea, again, is that you forecast the environment, and then the probabilities of the types will drop out via a GFE procedure. Again, it's a much simpler approach and easier to update, especially during complex weather situations. It consists of three grids, and you'll create these and or edit those as needed. Um, again, the data will be available from the RAP and the NAM and the GFS, which can be blended as well. Again, that gives you the opportunity that if you think a blend is doing better, or um, let's say, for example, none of these models are doing good, you have the ability to adjust the environment to help match reality. You can also include road temperatures if they are you know, causing icing, say, uh, on roads, whereas the rest, of, you know, you're just getting a rain situation, but you've been in such a long period of cold that you're getting the icing on roads. And again, these top-down grids can be quickly accessed via the third step of Forecast Builder. So the first top-down grid is the max wet bulb aloft, and this is defined as the warmest wet bulb temperature from 2,000 feet above the ground up to 400 millibars. And you can get observed values for this grid from Rayob and Tamdar data. And again, in GFE, as I've st stated earlier, G the GFS, the NAM, and RAP are all available. And this happened to replace the max teal loft grid here recently in August 2016. Generally, East of the plains, per research here at La Crosse, the max temperature aloft and the max wet bulb aloft are the same. And many of the mixed precipitation type events that we've looked at both on, in Rauber and, La, and research here at La Crosse, um, pretty much all of them, they're almost, almost identical. So no impact there. However, from the high plains on westward, there's a much better precipitation type performance. And on the right, you will see how the max wepple aloft maps to a precipitation type. So as you start at zero, you're basically looking at a snow. And then you get to like two to three Celsius. For the most part, you're in that sleet range. And then you go up to four Celsius and you're getting into the liquid. That could be either rain or freezing rain, depending on the, on the two meter temperature. And again, the the prerequisite of this module being the top-down um, science training, um, this should look very familiar to you. Here's an example of the max wet bulb aloft from 2007, December 1st. In reality, this is the max temperature aloft, but for this event, they're nearly identical. And again, you see this massive warm surge that came up from the south. So you start off with mostly a snow as the P-type, in that colors of purple to white. And then as those reds move in, representative of mostly four Celsius and above, you switched over from, from that snow to a sleet to then a rain, again, in that four, four area. And again, the surface temperature switching things maybe over to freezing rain. The next grid of the top downs is the prob ice present. And this is defined as the probability that ice exists in the clouds. Not that ice exists at the surface or ice accumulation. No, this is the probability that ice exists in the clouds. And I kind of have an example here on the right where if you look up above, say, minus 8 Celsius, which is the general beginnings of the ice production zone, you'll notice it's pretty dry. And as these values for prob ice present decrease to zero, the snow and sleet will decrease and the liquid will increase. Note, and take a big caution mark on this, is that the loss of ice can also mean precipitation is ending. This is why with the forecast builder and the cron-based procedure that you don't get the prob ice present grids produced because you could end up with a high amount of false alarm of freezing rain. So really, when you're using this prob ice present grid, make sure that you are producing precipitation. Observed values for this grid can be found in IR imagery, Rayob, and Tamdar data. Again, you have GFS, NAM, and RAP data. And how those um, models compute prob ice present? The first part 
is check in for the deep dry layer. You can think that cedar feeder process. Again, this should be kind of a review for the from the top down science training. And then we're going to apply aircraft research, uh, a probability based on the RH with respect to ice for temperatures that are minus 8C and colder. And here you can see that curve that as those temperatures get colder, the probability of ice in the cloud increases. Again, take a look at the probability weather type documentation for further details. Take a quick example again from the same case, December 1st, 2007. You'll note that you start off with full ice, and then uh, as the afternoon and evening comes into play, you see this drop to zero, and that's a dry slot uh, that came into play and caused all our snow and sleet to change over to freezing freezing rain or rain based on the surface temperature and you know despite the fact that i mean we are already seeing the warm layer come up but we with that warm layer is also coming a dry slot this last top down grid outside road temperature is prob free sleet this is defined as the probability that liquid from a loft you know so you have to melt can refreeze to sleet so that means that your max wet bubble loft grid must have values of greater than 3C to ensure liquid. And an ex example sounding here on the right from, Matt, from Madison on December 28th, 2015, you'll see that warm nose around 800 millibars. It's pretty much saturated and sitting around 5 Celsius. So good refreeze uh, example, at least from that max wet bubble loft. Again, this is a generally rare grid to edit. Um, mostly Northern Plains offices through the Great Lakes will encounter this. Observed values inclu uh, include surface data with Rayob or Tamdar. Uh, you probably have to look at both. Your dual pole, you may see a signature, uh, a double ring reflecting your refreeze to sleep. GFS, NAM, and RAP data are available as well. And to do the computation for this in these models, the first part is going to be checking for a cold dome that's at least 2,500 feet thick and colder than minus 2. Based on research, if you get warmer than that, you're pretty much going to end up with just a, a liquid you will not be able to refreeze. The probabilities for, re for refreezing increase pretty quickly as the temperature in that cold dome decreases. So you're 10% at minus 4 to 100% at minus 8. So pretty sensitive. So taking a quick look at that in a graphical form, you'll see that in, in this chart that you go from, you, you steeply increase as you get to that minus 8 level. Again, more details are listed in the POUT documentation. So an example, Again, this December 1st event had it as well. So the warm nose came in, melted, but the problem was is that there was still plenty of, shall of shallow, relatively speaking, you know, at least making that 2,500 feet threshold deep enough to allow that to refreeze. So, for example, at La Crosse, we switched over to sleet due to melting and then sleet due to refreezing before the dry slot came in and completely scoured out the ice, not allowing the refreeze to, re to happen, and went over to straight old you know, rain, freezing rain, that, that situation. Hmm. Lastly is this road temperature check. Uh, it's, and this too, kind of an optional grid, uh, only used when you have issues where, with your road temperatures causing things like icing. But anyway, the grid titled road temperature, typical situations you'll run into is either rain after a long period of cold that causes the icing on the roads, or maybe <clears throat> even more rare, but it can happen, uh, is freezing rain in late spring where the roads have all warmed up, but you're exposed surfaces are below freezing so they're experiencing icing. So two situations here if the road temperature grid depicts values less than or equal to 32 and you've got rain in the forecast the rain probabilities will also get copied of freezing rain. Kind of doing a 50-50 here if you will. Both are you know equally likely to occur. The reverse here, and now if the road temperature is greater than 32, 
and freezing rain is forecast, then the freezing rain probabilities are also copied to rain. Again, going 50-50 uh, approach. And this will all impact your ice accumulation, uh, both situations downstream. So to get observed values for road temperature, iris is a great, great place to look at. And then for the forecasts, there's this website here listed that you can look at. It's also referenced in Forecast Builder for the top-down step. A few additional top-down notes. Your hourly temperatures and dew points, these and are separate rain from freezing rain. This is why they are, you know, they're a foundation grid, both of them. Uh, and the reason the dew points come into play is the Fram ice model. If your max wet bulb aloft happens to be less than half a degree Celsius, the assumption is it's a rain snow situation. Max wet bulb aloft is defined as 2,000 feet above the ground. If you start getting that below, you know, a half degree Celsius, you know, that's now you're at that that threshold where you're going to get into rain snow situations. Note that you can also get freezing rain in this scenario, um, but that depends if you have any prob ice present grids. Uh, in your forecast and that they depict a loss of ice in the cloud and you may have that um, you may have a rain snow situation that starts going over to freezing rain that, that has happened before another situation here for the top, top down is a deep cold isothermal layer situation here being the max wet bulb aloft greater than 1 celsius and the temperature is greater than 32 fahrenheit then the p-type is going to go to rain and note that you can still get freezing rain <laughs> in this scenario. Uh, this, if the temperature happens to be between 32 and 35, and the surface wet bulb is 32 or below, and that's again why the first bill out there talks about the dew points separating the rain from freezing rain. Again, both are included, and again, that's from the Fram research that they have had situations of. And we've even experienced that here at the La Crosse office where your temperatures were above freezing, but we were getting freezing rain because our surface wet bulb was below freezing. And here's, here's an example of a deep cold isothermal layer uh, where you can see you're hugging pretty close to the zero C line. You're sitting around one. If we didn't have this deep cold isothermal layer check in there, this situation would present itself as probably a a snow snow slash sleet but this correction changes it over to rain so here's some quick example output that came from that december 1st 2007 case looking at rain in the upper left freezing rain in the upper right sleet in the bottom left and snow in the bottom right yeah good luck at drawing these by hand and this is all that comes out of the top down um GFE procedures that will drive these off of that. So, yeah, you just adjust those environmental inputs based on observed and model data. Your types drop out, and then further on, your snow, ice, and weather. Uh, again, makes things, I think, a lot easier um, for you during complex weather. So, in summary, this approach has provided many benefits, a quick and meteorologically sound way of developing precipitation type forecasts, Again, you have the ability to blend models, no restriction to a single model. An ability to handle scenarios more quickly when no models are handling the weather con correctly, and that can happen. You can also handle situations where icing is only occurring on the roads. And if you want to find more on this December 1st, 2007 case, you can visit our website uh, and the specific event there listed. And again, if you have any questions, feedback, please email me. My email address there, andy.just at noah.gov. And thanks for watching.